going. Um, but just to sort of give you an idea of the flow for the day, the day today, um, I'm going to give just a really brief, like, couple of minute um, introduction on chapitalization so that we kind of have a couple of things to structure our discussion. And then I'm going to bring Matthew in and he's going to tell us about his chapitalization experiments. So just one more minute while everybody gets their, um, their stuff into the chat box. Did everybody get their samples okay? Did they come on time? Is anybody missing samples? Okay, good. Good. I was a little worried about the timing there, so. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go into screen share. I don't know if you can still see the chat box in the screen share, but I can't see the chat box anymore when I go into screen share, so. Um, but let me see if we can get going here. Okay. All right, so let me just talk a little bit about capitalization. And like I said, this is meant to be a very brief introduction. In the next couple of weeks, I'll also put out a newsletter that has a little bit more in-depth information on some of the things I'm talking about here. But when we talk about capitalization, you know, definitionally, we're just talking about adding sugar to grape juice or must in order to raise the alcohol of the resulting wine. So we're adding sugar, but we're adding that at the very front end of it so that it gets fermented away with the idea of increasing alcohol on the back end of it. This is not a new technique at all. Most of us probably chapitalized to a, a fair amount here in Virginia. It actually has been, um, it's in the historical record as far back as the Romans. They used to use honey into their fermentations because they recognized that it improved the body and the mouthfeel of the wine. Um, it gets its name from Napoleon's Minister of Agriculture, Jean-Antoine Chaptal. He made this famous in the early 1800s because he really advocated for the use of sugar to improve the French wines. It turns out at the time they didn't really know why it made it better because they didn't know all of the things about um, the chemistry of fermentation that it was really just raising the ethanol on the other side of it. Um, but they recognized that it, it made some improvements in the wine. Just a couple of calcula or uh, practical things. Um, when we talk about capitalization, whenever we would start harvest, I would have to relook up these numbers. And so I like to put them in print whenever possible. Um, when you are capitalizing, it's, it's important to sort of realize what potential alcohol you're starting with and then know how much sugar to get to the target alcohol that you have. So usually when we're calculating potential alcohol, that comes off of our initial bricks number. And then we use a conversion factor to be able to tell how much alcohol we should expect from that. When you look in the literature, that conversion rate can be anywhere from about 0.56 to about 0.6. So for example, if you have a, a, must, a juice that's coming in at about 20 bricks, your potential alcohol from that calculation could be anywhere from like 11 to, to about 12%. So that's one thing to remember when you're capitalizing is that um, the conversion rate is different depending on a number of different things in your fermentation. So partially your yeast have different conversion rates. So you can have high converting yeast or low converting yeast. There's been a lot more interest in low converting yeast as like as BRICS numbers go up and up and up in hot dry regions um, with the effect of, of global warming. Um, but some other things that can affect that conversion as well. Um, the temperature of the fermentation, hotter fermentations tend to have a lower conversion rate. Um, and also kind of the open top tanks even you can have, you can sort of lose more alcohol off of it. So we used to use, for example, we used to use 0.6 for like uh, temperature controlled white wine fermentations um, because in those tank fermentations that are just kind of going to go slow for a while, those tended to convert at about 0.6. But warm, um, uh, warm red wine fermentations and open top containers like tea bins or just the big um, stainless steel containers that have the variable lids, then you get a lower conversion rate. So we'd use 0.56. And then kind of in the middle, you sometimes we would do these barrel fermentations that were a little bit warm, so they would kind of be about 0.58. Or if you're doing a cooler red fermentation, you might go to 0.58. So just keeping that in mind, again, as you're determining your target um, alcohol, that there is a range there. So um, don't aim too high or too low. Kind of aim for the middle is a good, good way to do that. And then when you get your, your potential alcohol, knowing how much to add, again, the textbook I looked it up in, um, gives you 17 grams of sugar, gives you 1% ethanol. But again, there's a range there. So usually you can see a range somewhere between 16 and 18. And that goes back to exactly those same things, that conversion rate. So um, again, you're going to get a little bit more bang for your buck in a slow, cool fermentation and a little bit less in a, in a warmer fermentation. Um, I think the experiment that we're looking at today, the conversion was at, or they 
we calculated it off of 18 grams per liter because it was a red wine fermentation that had a little bit less conversion rate. But all of that to say, you know, I think in the end, we're kind of thinking about when we're deciding for capitalization, um, you can kind of get to a certain target, but the question is, is how far can I, can I push that target? There's some other technical questions like when to add it, what kinds of, of sugar to add, those sorts of things. We're not going to look at when to add it um, in our discussion today, although I'll put that in a newsletter in a couple of weeks. There's some things I found when I dug around about that. But today we're really just going to be looking at sort of how much, what, how much do we add to get to a target that gives us that fullness of, of mouthfeel, but also doesn't sort of unbalance the wine. Um, and so just to kind of take a quick poll here, and this is where I'm going to ask you, since I cannot see your chat box, I'm going to ask you to actually unmute yourself and say out loud, when you, for example, when you bring in Merlot, what's your target alcohol for Merlot, either to pick that or to chaptalize to? What kind of targets are you, are you looking for? So go ahead and unmute yourself and just say it out loud. Nobody's talking. I'm going to start talking. 23, 23 and a half. So, uh, so let, can we talk in, let's talk in, well, at 23 and a half, uh, maybe let's talk, if you have a target alcohol, that would be, that would be good. But 23 and a half bricks, okay. 13.5. Okay, 13.5% alcohol, okay. 13 to 14. Percent alcohol, okay. Yes. Okay. 12 and a half. 12 and a half, all right. Um, me, I'm from 12 to 13. Okay. Because the, the Merlot is going to end up blended, so it's not, depending on vintage, not so much of an issue. It's more of a brightness thing, so. Okay. So you're using it more as a blender for. So Correct. To the Merlot for the alcohol. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't think of, I'm thinking primarily of our vineyard, so. Um, I'm not thinking of that as going to be structurally part of a, the bigger part of the alcohol part of the blend. Okay. So uh, as ripe as I can get it before it starts to fall apart and, right. and look like nice fruit, um, then we, we use, we'll pick it. Um, but um, like, for example, last year, the numbers were great. So we didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah, last year was a different thing. So, okay. So let's, let's say, let me ask you this other question. Let's say that you're bringing in Merlot and it's at 20 bricks for whatever reason, maybe it's 2018 and you brought in 20 bricks Merlot. What's your limit for chaptalization? Like what, how much alcohol are you willing to add by chaptalizing to a 20 Brooks Merlot? Again, you maybe one and a half to two and a half. Yeah. If it's, if it's at 20 or a little bit more than 20, 22 would be the upper limit. But if, if it was 18 or, or between, below, below 20, like on the lower, higher end of 19, um, I just put it in the press. Okay. That's, that's what I learned in 2018. I mean, it doesn't have enough. Sorry. Yeah, it should be dependent on style and a phenolic load. Yeah. Certainly. Certainly. David, I didn't hear, I, I saw you say something and I didn't hear what you said. Can you repeat what you said, David? Uh, I, if the fruit comes in less than 20 or tw around 20, then I'm not going to push it past 12 and a half or 13 generally. But Okay. So 20, yeah, so we said it was what, 11, two to, so you're like 1.5%, maybe 2%. Yep. Okay. Anybody above three? Okay. So this, this is a question that came up a lot in 2018. So I got this question, I'm sure um, others got it as well. Like how much can we chaptalize for these wines that we still need to make red wine out of? Um, and so I did look at, at that time, I looked up a couple of different things, and it turns out there's a couple of questions that go along with that. So some of it's legal, right? So if we look at European law, European law is a little bit more discreet about all of this, but when you ask different winemakers that, that train in, 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 um, in Europe, you actually get different numbers depending on where they trained. Um, but in the cooler regions in, in Europe, it, for example, in Germany, they're allowed to capitalize up to about 3% as long as they're not overshooting 11.5% on a white wine or 12% on a red wine. Um, so they're, they're allowed to add more in, but just not to a huge target. But as you go through the zones, A is cooler, B, is, B get, is sort of in the middle, and C is warmer. And you can see in the warmer regions, they're allowed to go up to about 1.5%. Um, and, but again, that sort of upper target, they can go up to about 12.5% or 13.5% alcohol, depending on the region. 
So in that case, there's sort of the, that understanding that there's some style that goes with the region, but also just what, what the weather is able to do. The other thing with European law is if it's a particularly bad year, for example, like our 2018, those, all of that, that legality goes up by another half percent. So in Germany, you could actually capitalize up to about three and a half percent in a bad year. Does anybody know what the US law is? Anybody know about US laws on capitalization? Well, you, <laughs> you don't can't worry use about sugar. it. Right? <laughs> is it 4%? Right? I feel like it's 4%. <laughs> so it turns out in the US, you are only allowed to use pure dry sugar or concentrated fruit juice from the same fruit. So that means you can't use honey, but you can use like dry sugar or grape juice concentrate, no apple juice concentrate. And you can't get above, you can't capitalize to above 25 bricks. So basically if you're at 25 bricks or above, you can't capitalize further up. So you can't capitalize, for example, up to like 27 bricks if you're coming in at 23 bricks, for example. And then different laws or different states have different laws on top of that. And they tend to go based on like the, the state itself. So hot dry states might, or, or regions in hot dry states may not allow capitalization at all, but you probably shouldn't need it there. Other states won't let you use tartaric acid because you probably shouldn't need it there. So our state laws are more, are more restrictive there. In Virginia, we can basically do any of the things that it says on pure dry sugar, not about 25. Um, so why capitalize? Why not just let it be what it is? What are the, what are the things capitalization gets for us? So again, you can unmute yourself and, and speak in a lot. I mean, most of us are capitalizing. So what are we trying to achieve with that capitalization? Bottle stability. Pardon? Bottle stability. Bottle stability. So what kind of stability in the bottle that like? Uh, microbiological. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of the creatures that might be spoilers are less active when they're when there's more alcohol. Okay. Other reasons? Mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. Yeah. Yep. So we can get more mouthfeel with more alcohol. Anything else? Structure. Structure. I didn't see who said structure. Who said structure? Victor. Victor. Um, okay. Yeah. So you can. So what's your experience with structure and capitalization? I would just say since it improves the body, you know. Yeah. Overall, the structure gets a little bit improved, but of course, it's a balance of everything else. Right. Right. Okay. Other reasons? Herbaceous. Herbaceousness, it covers up that herbaceous uh, aromatic a little bit, it helps to, um, it's solvent, it stays in the, in the wine a little bit better. Okay, so it can, it can cover up or reduce some of the, the perception of herbaceousness, for sure. Anything else? These are all great. Aging potential, on red especially. Okay, yep, yeah, aging potential. So that might go somewhat back to that microbial stability and sometimes just helping things come together a little bit. When I looked at the literature, this is what I found. Um, definitely microbial stability. Sometimes it can add viscosity, palate weight or volume, which we've talked about. Um, it can actually help to volatilize fruit aromas. So a little bit higher alcohol can make your wine seem a little bit fruitier. Um, because some of those secondary aromas are, are more likely to come up and be, pre or be perceptible. Um, adding sugar actually makes the yeast make a little bit more glycerol, which can, can contribute to mouthfeel. Succinic acid, which can contribute a little bit of freshness, and esters, which again are fruity floral aromas. So it actually kind of can kick the, the yeast into making a little bit more of that. Alcohol itself has a perception of sweetness. So your wine can seem a little bit more sweet and sometimes we associate sweet with fruity. Um, and so it can sort of amplify some of those other sweet tastes like berry and strawberry and that sort of thing. It can make those a little bit more present. Uh, but we also have to remember that, that only, it, it only seems sweet up to a point at which point it starts to be burning or caustic. And so that's that balance point we need to think about with our, with our targets. And there's not like one magic number for that. That's depending on what the, what the wine around it will, um, will support. It can mask a little bit of bitterness, um, which 
was interesting to me. Um, and then as Mark said, it can diminish some of the green or um, unripe characteristics of a wine. There was a really good demonstration of this a couple of years ago. Um, there was a paper that came out. This was actually the ASE, ASEV paper of the year in 2018. It is in the public domain. So if you're interested in looking more at this, please let me know and I can get you that paper um, because you can, it, they made it free for everybody. Um, but basically this was work that was done by, by a research group. And actually that research group worked out of Jim Herbertson's lab. Jim Herbertson came and spoke to us at the VVA technical meeting a couple of years ago and talked about this work. But basically they, they harvested red or uh, Merlot at three different levels of bricks. And then they manipulated the fermentations to the other levels of bricks. So they had nine, nine um, fermentations total. So the, the things that were harvested at 20 bricks were chaptalized to 24 and 28. The ones at 24 and 28 were either watered back, I'm sorry, sanied and then watered back to achieve the lower bricks or chaptalized up to the higher bricks. Um, there's a lot of really interesting information in this particular study, but we're just going to look at one here. Um, if you look at, at uh, what this, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, so I'll stop trying to use it. If we look at this graph, basically they did some, a lot of sensory analysis on this and said, you know, what are the sensory descriptors of these different, um, these different treatments? So if you look at the graph on the top here, and wherever it says H and then a number, that tells you which harvest it is. So H1 is the first harvest at 20 bricks. H2 is the second harvest at 24 bricks, and H3 is the third harvest at 27 bricks. And then when you look at the axes here, these are sort of a, an amalgam of descriptors that amongst the, the different descriptors that they looked at. So if things are, the closer things are together, the more closely they were described in terms of their flavors and their aromas. And if you look at it, the H, let's take the H1, that early harvest, for example, H1 tends, if you, the H1s sort of tend to, to um, the circles for the H1s tend to sort of go all over the graph. But if you look at just the low, the low, um, the low ethanol ones, they tend to clump together. And so what that tells us is that the ethanol concentration is having a big effect on the sensory descriptors, more so than the ripeness of the fruit at harvest. So again, if you look at the H1, or I'm sorry, the H1 low, the H2 low, and the H3 low, those are all clumping together in that quadrant in the lower left-hand side of the graph. So that's telling us that even if it was harvested at 27 bricks, the descriptors are like those of those that were just harvested at 21 bricks or 20 bricks. And if we want to know what those descriptors are, that's the graph on the bottom there. And I realize it's pretty small and kind of hard to read, but the descriptors that are sort of in that quadrant are vegetal, bell pepper, sour, earthy, and lemon. So even, so basically a 27 brick set of fruit that was watered back to 20 bricks tastes like it's underripe. And the opposite is also somewhat shown. If you look at the, where the high descriptors are, um, the H2 and H3 high are clumping together, but you'll notice H1 doesn't do that. Um, and if we look at the descriptors in this sort of quadrant of H1 or the, the high ethanol ones, the high ethanol ones had descriptors like dark fruit, dried fruit, sweet, spice, body, that sort of thing. So, but you, you notice that the H1 low is kind of sitting out by itself, right? So there's a limit to how underripe the fruit can get to get all the way to those sensory descriptors. But overall, the conclusions of this particular study were so shocking to me that I just wrote them out for you. Um, basically, they, they looked at all the chemistry, they found the expected things there, but they, they found that adjustments for ethanol had a greater effect on wine sensory properties than fruit maturity did. They also found that um, wines made from ripe or overripe fruit adjusted to low ethanol concentrations were described similarly to wines made from unripe fruit, including green and sour. Those are the sort of ones that were clumping in the lower left. And then wines made from unripe or ripe fruit adjusted to high ethanol concentrations were described similarly to wines made from overripe fruit including red fruit and flora descriptors. So there's something about that ethanol that's shifting the flavor profiles of those wines. And they conclude that the wine ethanol concentration was actually more important for the sensory profiles than fruit maturity at harvest. Now we know that there is a limit to that, but I think it's a compelling paper that should make us think about the levels that we're chaptalizing. So all of that work was done on 
Washington State Merlot. So the question is, is what are those kinds of targets look like for our Virginia fruit? Because our fruit is different than what they're coming in in Washington State. And that's where the current experiment that we'll talk about the rest of the day today is coming in. So let me go ahead and bring in Mathieu. So Mathieu, do you want to um, tell us just a little bit about, now we just went over some like general things with capitalization, but do you want to come in and tell us a little bit about what you were trying to achieve in looking at capitalization in your Merlot, um, particularly on this, this particular block? You have Mathieu? Mathieu? I can see you, but I can't hear you. Oh, he's having, okay, so he's having some technical difficulties, it looks like. Okay, so maybe we should, maybe I'll go ahead and, nope. Oh. Ah, he's going to call us, it looks like. Uh, yeah, do you hear me? Yes, welcome. Yes, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> uh, for some reason, my, you know, my microphone wasn't working. So anyway. Well, this, um, this is a good solution. So tell us a little bit about your Merlot capitalization experiment. Why did you want to uh, play around with the capitalization levels of this particular Merlot? Uh, leaf roll, that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a block of Merlot that's got leaf roll virus uh, and, uh, and kind of gets stuck every, every year on like 20, 21 breaks. Um, it's a it's a good block. I mean, it used to be my best block in the in the vineyard, uh, but it's an old block and it's got like for literal virus and it's not ripening any longer. Uh, so I've tried to let it hang for a long time and all these kind of things, but like usually I, I stuck around twenty twenty one bricks, and uh, I still like the quality of the of the fruit coming out of there. And uh, and again, like coming from Northern Rhone. Uh, for us, something was limited to capitalize no more than uh, two percent alcohol, and um, and it never really uh, struck me to do anything different until now. Uh, for me, in my, I mean, based on what I've learned in the past, I always I was thinking that if I was going more than two percent alcohol, then I will create um, alcohol dilution, dilution, and the wine will uh, taste hot and. Uh, and out of balance, I will feel the alcohol in the wine. So I was, I always keep my uh, my sugar addition like very often no more than uh, than thirty grams per liter, so uh, three bricks. Um, that was my uh, that was my limit until two thousand and eighteen. Um, and uh, two thousand, like a lot of things, that, that's uh, come with a mistake uh, uh, that's been done in the winery where. I mean, 18, I didn't touch ground uh, during harvest because everything was coming at the same time and we had everything to do. <clears throat> I didn't sleep much. And um, sometimes I write down two times the same work order um, of, um, of sugar addition. I, and I noticed that on the evening. And I had two of my cellar workers that picked the two different work order. And in the same day, the same batch of, uh, of wine was uh, chattelized twice. And I was very, very um, worried about it uh, because uh, he had much, much higher level of uh, sugar than I was planning to. Uh, and it turned out that uh, at the end, uh, that was one of the wines that was tasting the ripest out of the whole, uh, out, of, out of 2018. And, uh, and after this um, uh, problem, I will say, I decided to, uh, to play with it last year. And even if last year was a ripe year, I still had this block of Merlot that still gets stuck around the same bricks level. So it was still a good candidate to do a, a, a chaptalization, even, uh, even 2019. Great. So do you wanna, can you tell us a little bit about um, the different treatment levels that you, that you chose and how you set up the, the experiment? What did, well, you had five, we have, we have five wines total. So tell us what all five of them are. We're, we'll talk about the whole thing and then we'll, break it down by the different flights that we talk, that we tasted. Yeah, so 
Yeah. So there's, there's one thing that I've done when I was working in Burgundy, not that I've done really, but that, that I've learned at school. Um, it's, I know some people use sometimes to use brown sugar to do the fertilization instead of white sugar. And, um, and, and in fact, the, the myth, um, uh, the myth was like the brown sugar might give you a bit more fattiness into the wine because you're going to get a little bit more of um, probably some byproduct of the fermentation, maybe more glycerol. So it was maybe giving a, a, a different mouthfeel. Uh, and, uh, and so that's one part of the experimentation. I wanted to, uh, um, to compare uh, brown sugar versus white sugar into the fertilization. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the, uh, the other part of, of the experimentation was different level. So I had uh, one that wasn't chaptalized at all. Uh, and then after I had two other uh, level of chaptalization, and that's probably in the documents, so if you want to start showing that, but uh, one that is go was going much more than I usually do, uh, and, and one that was more into my, what, I, what I used to consider my limits. Okay. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and we'll, we'll see a couple of slides to get pictures of that. But Mathieu, you can keep, you can keep yeah. uh, talking in at the same time. So uh, okay. let's see if I can figure out how to do this again. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. OK. Um, OK, so as Mathieu said, he's got this block of, of Merlot that comes in um, without a lot of bricks, even in this particular year. So th this year, that, that block was harvested at 19.7 bricks with a potential alcohol then and our calculation of about 11%. It was treated the same so way. So I, I, yeah. I, I, I guess at the time Rick would have put that in his, into his rosé. Right. I'm glad <laughs> I didn't, by the way. Exactly, so I mean, but that's the other option, right? Is that like, either you need, to, like you said, it's got leaf roll and it does this all the time. So either you need to replant it, call it rosé, or see if this works, right? So those are your practical options. I mean, we, 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 are, we are replanting and, but it's still my better, one of my better blocks of, uh, of Merlot, so I, don't, I, I still don't want to, uh, to, use it, to use this specific block for my rosé. So let's okay. say this one. Yeah, so, um, so it was you know, treated like red wine is treated. You can see the, the um, specifics of that in the report. I would say there was a small sanya here, but it was, they were careful to make sure that that was the same proportion for each of the bins, so our comparison was still good. After the third day of fermentation, is when Mathieu did the chaptalization. So there was a control bin that didn't get chaptalized. There was a bin that got 30 grams per liter of sugar, which would give us about 1.6% alcohol bump. And then one that got 50 grams per liter of sugar, which would be about 2.7% alcohol bump. Um, and then there was a 30 grams per liter of brown sugar bin and a bin with 50 grams of brown sugar. So in the, in the end, we had all five of these treatments. So I'll show you the chemistry for all five of them, and then we'll kind of talk about how we broke down um, those, those various things for comparisons in your tasting. Um, so when we look, first of all, just at like what the actual, what we thought we were gonna get alcohol-wise with that addition, what we ended up getting, the potential alcohol in the control was 11, and the measured alcohol was 10 and a half. Um, so, and there could be a number of reasons for that. Again, that 11 was, was calculated with the lower rate there. So it could be a conversion thing. Um, but one other thing that came to mind when I was looking at that is just sort of a technical thing of when we're taking bricks off of juice that just came off of red wine. Sometimes it's pretty solid. There's a lot of solids in there. And sometimes that can make our, our densitometers think that we have a little bit more solid in there than we do. So that may have been a, a, bricks, um, a, a measurement of the bricks that had a lot of solids, or that might have just been a conversion thing. Um, but when we look at the, the different chaptalization rates, we do see that for, for each of those chaptalization rates, we did get roughly what we expected. So we expected about 1.6 on our 30-part ad, and we expected roughly about 2.7 on our 50-part ad. So in that case, we did get about what we expected there. And we don't see big differences between the brown sugar and the white sugar. The yeast see this, see sucrose as sucrose. The other things are sort of auxiliary to those. Um, and then when we look at the wine chemistry, we wouldn't really expect to see a big difference in wine chemistry on these, and we don't. So the pHs, the TAs, um, they're all pretty much the same for, the, for each, of the, each of the lots. And again, we wouldn't expect to see big differences there. 
Um, we do get col color is analyzed as part of our analysis packet. Um, and in this case, I was a little bit surprised by the difference in color that we see here. The control had lower color intensity than the other um, treatments did. Now, we know that color is affected by a lot of different things, including the pH, the free sulfur, um, and a number of the phenolic components in the wine. Um, but in this case, the, the pHs are not that different from one another, and the free sulfurs aren't that different from one another. Um, so this indicates to us that there may be some differences in the phenolics which higher alcohol would maybe give us better extraction of the phenolics. And so that's a clue that, that maybe we are getting some effect of the alcohol along the way. Um, so when we started to think about how to taste these, we, we thought that there was really kind of two main comparisons that we wanted to do. So the first flight that you tasted was a comparison of um, the control with 30 grams per liter of white sugar and 50 grams per liter of white sugar. So most of us are using white sugar, so that seemed to be uh, a, the, the best sort of comparison there. Um, so this gives you sort of the decoding of your different flights. I'll leave that up for just a minute. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll decode both flights and then we'll go back um, to gallery view and, and discuss the sensory on both of them so that we can, we can move the slides along. Um, so again, that was our control, 30 grams per liter of white sugar and 30 grams per liter of, I'm sorry, 50 grams per liter of white sugar. Um, and I need to look, oh, okay. I was in group three, so I just had to see what my answer is. Okay, and then the second one, um, we wanted to do a comparison of the white sugar versus the brown sugar. Um, we gave you the 50 grams per liter treatment of that because we felt like if there was a difference, there would maybe be more of a difference if we added more sugar. So um, that was a comparison of white sugar versus brown sugar at that 50 gram per liter level. Um, and again, that one was a, a triangle test. And so um, the first one, we were just asking you descriptors, but that one, we actually asked you if you could tell the difference. So we'll go back and, and talk about that in just a minute too. So, okay, so let me go ahead and close out of the slides and we can start talking about what you thought of the ones. Uh oh, something went wrong there. All right, okay. Okay, so let's go back to that first, um, the, the first flight, so the one where we had that comparison of zero, 30, and 50. Um, I'm curious to hear what you all thought about the, the effect of the added sugar there. Did, um, did chaptalization affect your perception of you know, ripeness or fruit character or any of those things that we thought we might be seeing a difference? Feel free to I mean, I'm, I'm, gonna stop. I'm gonna stop because otherwise nobody talks. So somebody needs to be- <laughs> I'll start calling uh, people. Yeah, so like, let, let's do that. Uh, but no, anyway, uh, for, for me, um, it's, uh, I, I, I feel like, again, I, it was very easy for me to rate the wine based on the alcohol, uh, alcohol level uh, and, and based on the, on the ripeness. I mean, it's, uh, it matched what's been described in the, in the studies, uh, the one with for me with higher alcohol and with more sugar uh, definitely tastes uh, riper and more balanced. I mean, to my palate, uh, than the one that is a control for me is very very flat, uh, diluted, weak, uh, and uh, and you know I don't have any burning sensation with uh, uh, when I do a chartalization at uh, at 50 grams per liter. Uh, things that I used to never do. I don't have any burning sensation uh, out of it. And I do prefer this, this wine compared to the other ones. Okay. Yeah, how about others? Were you able to, like when, when you heard what the levels were, um, were you surprised by either any of those? Did it make sense to you which ones were which? For me personally, I felt like the control was obvious. Um, there was to me a difference between the 30 and 50, but maybe not as much of a difference as there was between the control and the 30. Um, but what do you all think? For me, the, um, in, in hindsight, it's really actually kind of cool, but um, the control was thin and not too much, but the 30 grams per liter, uh, the acidity in that was more of a sweet tart acidity. Okay. The one with the highest, the highest sugar, um, I thought, express the barrel a little bit more too a little bit richer um more of a more more of a balance 
it was uh, more harmonious. Uh, it's very surprising. Uh, okay. Good job. Okay. okay. Other impressions? What I wasn't feeling to much of a difference between the 30 and the 50, but they were both obviously different than the control. So they both had a lot more weight to them. The control kind of seemed thin, chasing against the other two, but I wasn't pulling them apart from themselves. If I had given you a triangle test, you would have picked out the control as the one that was different, but the other two not so different. Okay, and I see Sharon yes. like nodding her head also. Let me ask this specifically. What do you think about the 50 gram per liter one? Do you feel like that throws the wine out of balance? Or do you feel like this wine is carrying that? Okay. I think it carries it fine. I think it's... It gives it viscosity, it gives it palate weight, it gives it body, it's nice. Uh, you, you, you know, Rick, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because I don't know if you remember last year with 2018, I've, uh, I've done an experimentation how to build up the mouthfeel on, uh, on 2018 uh, reds. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've, I've tried like a bunch of like analytical products, uh, you know, uh, I mean, yeast, uh, uh, tannins and and all all of other things to try to uh, to fill up the wine to fill up the 2018 that were fairly light. And all uh, you have to do is go to Costco. Uh, and yeah, going to Costco is less expensive. Correct. Uh, and uh, and you don't add any anything into your wine other than sugar. So right. Again, like knowing that this year is going to be a bad year because we're going to have the hurricane. So you know, I'm going to be <laughs> loading up with sugar. Uh, because I feel it's, mo it's got more effect into, into the mouse fields than almost anything else that I've been adding to the wine lately. I think that's an important point that, you know, this, this past year, 2019, was a, very, a pretty ripe year. And so I think the other question would be what happens if you capitalize this much on something like an 18 that maybe doesn't have as much comp like fruit and concentration coming with it. Um, and, and I think that's that uh, sort of getting back to Harbertson's paper where like, the, the, the two later harvests on the high rate of chapitalization sort of separated out from that earlier harvest. So if, you're, if your fruit is truly underripe, there probably is a limit to what you can do in pushing it here. But I think what we're looking at with this wine is something that maybe is more in that medium stage that just you're goosing up the, the ethanol on it. So I would, I would encourage you, Mathieu, or anyone else that wants to try this again in 2020 um, to see if we get that same result and what looks like it's probably going to be a little bit different vintage year in terms of um, you know development of our red wines. I I I think uh, I think uh, these techniques and again uh, I'm I'm going to try it this year obviously but I think this technique uh, linked with a heavy bleeding if you got a very wet vintage mm -hmm. uh, will uh, will get you. Uh, uh, into a good place and possibility producing still some some nice reds even on a very diluted vintage. Well, well, I, I think that signed you up for that experiment, Matthew. So thank you for volunteering. <laughs> you're welcome. I'd like to be interested in seeing if you're struggling to get the fruit to 18 bricks, like 2018, to see if the it was quite the same. Uh, even in, even in 2018, uh, I didn't get I, I get everything around 19 bricks. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm I'm usually like in the same range. I mean, 18. I I didn't enter, I didn't harvest it any reds that were uh, below 18 and a half, 19. You know. So. Let me ask this one more question, and then we'll move on to the second flight. But um, and and maybe I will do this as a show of hands, and I'm gonna actually record it so I can count it later. So tell me if you if you raise your hand if you preferred the control. Okay, now raise your hand if you preferred the 30 gram per liter edition. Okay, and now raise your hand if you preferred the 50 gram per liter edition. Melanie, you're cheating. You've been keeping your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using I tell the difference between the 30 and the 50. Well, so. yeah, for you, those okay. were both my preference. <laughs> okay. Okay, so any no other is actually so speaking for me right now. It's not even funny. I even have to unmute. She's saying exactly what I'm thinking. 
<laughs> okay. Any other um, any other comments about this particular flight before we move on to the next one? Okay, so let's move on to that next flight. And again, that one was the 50 gram per liter. We had white sugar versus brown sugar. So, um, and that one was a triangle test. So maybe first thing we'll do is a show of hands. Who was able to tell the difference in the triangle test between the two? Um, can, can I ask also, was it, was it light brown or dark brown sugar for a it, mix? Yeah, that's a good question. This is light brown sugar. Okay. Okay, I didn't see the show of hands there, but it didn't look like there were very many. Um, okay, so comments on the white sugar versus brown sugar. Maybe somebody that could tell a difference, um, maybe talk to us about what difference it was that, that you perceived in those wines. For, for me, it looks a little bit riper with the brown sugar. A little bit riper. I don't know, I've, I've, got, I've got more of this kind of like almost sweet feeling into the brown sugar. Okay. It's, uh, it's, I don't know. I, I feel like the, I, 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 I feel it, it hides a little bit more the greenness. I did, I did find the one with white sugar being a bit more greenish. Okay. Um, and I didn't, I'm sorry, we didn't go over this data, but we did, I mean, the residual sugar on all of these is less than one. So there's not a, a difference in the residual sugar on any of these. Um, Okay, other thoughts on the white sugar versus brown sugar? I got much better you and I aromatics. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sharon, can you repeat that, please? I got much, a much more and better aromatics. It had a, an interesting spicy, like a warm spice character to it that I couldn't place. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what that was. Absolutely. Okay. That, that pushed it for me was the aromatics and the spiciness and the, it's exactly right, spot on. When, when Mathieu and I tasted these together, I it must have been, what, two and a half months ago, um, the, the reason that we made sure to include this is that at the time, and we didn't taste it blind, but it did seem to me like there was almost a, it, um, it, it almost in my mind felt like a barrel, a little bit of barrel influence on the brown sugar one. Um, and that goes along with Sharon, what you're saying, I think in having some warmth or some spice that those are some things that we would sometimes look to a little bit of oak influence for, um, but it sort of hints in that direction and gives us a little bit more richness. This time around, I felt like it had a little, just it was a little bit richer for some reason. Um, but I'm curious, what, any other thoughts on the, on the differences between these two? I actually preferred the white sugar to the brown sugar because I felt that it tasted fresher and a little cleaner. You felt like it, it tasted what? A little cleaner and? A little cleaner and a little fresher. So I preferred the white sugar to the brown sugar. Okay. And that's probably a stylistic thing, right? Is like fresher versus more barely. Those are? Yep, I would agree. Great, thank you, Kirsty. I feel like I get more jammy notes from the brown sugar, you know, red fruit jam. Uh-huh. Okay. One question that comes up with this is the difference in cost. Um, I mean, we, we buy white sugar um, sometimes in very large amounts, and so we wonder what the cost breakdown is there. So I did look up today on the Sam's Club website what the relative cost of these things would be. For the white sugar, it comes out to about 51 cents per pound on the sugar. Um, whereas the light brown sugar gives us 64 cents a pound. And to sort of translate that like per barrel, like what does that really mean in our, in, in bigger parlance? It's about $12, I'm sorry, the 30 part ad is about $7.56 for the white sugar per barrel. Whereas the, the brown sugar is $9.52, so about $2 different per barrel on the 30 part ad. Um, so it's $12.60 for the, for the 50 part add on the white sugar and 1586. So, you know, less than $3. So it's not a big difference in price there. If you, if you feel like that makes a difference and it's a difference that you like, the price is not, not a big difference in those, in those different ones. So, okay. Any other comments on the white sugar versus brown sugar? Uh, uh, Jordan says little more length on the white sugar than the brown. Okay, the brown went a little fatter on the palate. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay. Other, other comments on white versus brown or on chaptalization in general? Anything else? Any other questions that you have um, for Mathieu? Well, those of you that have been around for a while might remember the sensory trials that we did and uh, I think uh, presented it either at round tables or maybe at, um, at uh, VVA where we, uh, we looked at um, sweet spots. We took a, a California produced um, Syrah and uh, took the alcohol out and then added alcohol back at various lengths of various degrees. And so the wines differ by only uh, about 0.2% alcohol as a gradient. And it was really quite remarkable, this, the, the sensory differences, the aromatic differences, and just minor differences in alcohol and, and how that um, uh, influence of the <clears throat> expression uh, in the wine it was really quite dramatic and it suggested this whole idea of sweet spot which is quite germane. Um, yeah that and Bruce maybe I'll, if that is that in your analogy note somewhere maybe I can include a link to that when I put the um, put the news. Yeah I, well I mean we're talking ancient history it is somewhere I'm sure okay. in there so well, if you look in the index now that I look know on the index here. Yeah. Look at the at the index under sweet spots. It's probably listed that way. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And yeah. So, any other general comments on questions for Matthew? Yeah. So I, I saw you added at at three days. That I assume that's after inoculation. Yeah. Um, what's everyone else doing? I mean, you know. I'm curious about, you know, doing a uh, longer wait to add to increase lag phase, perhaps. There might be some interesting uh, potential there for a research project, I would think. Um, yeah. But I'm generally not doing it right up front either. It's it's like day two or day three post inoculation. I used I, I used to do it uh, later. I, I used to do my sugar addition much much later. Uh, like usually, uh, uh, I even got a tendency to to wait. Uh, I'm speaking specific gravity, so I'm not sure how to translate. But probably to to, to wait around uh, when I'm getting like close to maybe ten breaks to do my uh, my uh, my sugar uh, my sugar addition. But I realize it doesn't change that much ultimately at the end. And as soon as I've got my fermentation going, I don't mind adding it. Also, um, for me, especially when I work with, uh, with tea beans, uh, it, adding some sugar will help to get up in temperature. And I realize that very often on my, uh, with my uh, fermentation beans, I cannot reach the temperature that I'm, I, I like to ferment hot. Uh, I, I like to go like 30, uh, Celsius degree, uh, but I, the, sometimes it's difficult for me to reach this temperature uh, if I had the sugar too late. Uh, so if I had the sugar earlier, I'm almost sure that I'm going to get a peak of fermentation uh, because of the, I mean, you're just giving crack to your yeast with sugar. So, you know, the, it, it, it goes much, much higher. And, and also you get the other reason faster. why I'm, I'm <laughs> The, Sorry, the, 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 the reason why I, I am doing it earlier now is it's a stupid reason, but it's because I don't forget. Because like when I'm in middle of harvest, trying to remember which one I need to chateleize <laughs> and how much I need to do it, what, what happened two days ago, I completely forget it. So I, like that, I don't have to, uh, to get to, to remember in the middle of my fermentation that I need to chateleize it. I do it right at the beginning. I crack my acid, I'm adding my sugar. I do it right at the beginning, and, uh, and then I can go sleep at night, and I don't have to, uh, any problem with like waking up in the middle of the night saying, like, ooh, I forget to chateleize it. So, so just uh, make my life easier. Is anybody adding it later? So, like, there are, I, I don't know if anyone on this call is adding it later, but I know there's some people that add it like fairly late. Is there anybody of that in that camp on the call that wants to talk about doing that or why? Um, I did do, and, and David, to answer your, a, a little, there is a little bit of background information in the literature on this. There was a small, like a little bit of a conversation about it a couple of years ago. Um, so I'll make sure to post the links for that, but there has been some work done 
particularly on the yeast ability to take sugar up um, at different parts of its of its um, uh, its development. So I'll make sure to to post those as well. But it but there's from that information, there's not one right answer, but rather a, there's some philosophy and, and a lot of it has to do as Mitchie was saying on whether you're trying to increase the rate of fermentation or if you're trying to slow it down if you prefer to have for example a cooler longer fermentation versus a hotter faster fermentation so but I'll make sure to put that um, on the on the website okay any other questions all right. Well, before we go today, I just I need to make sure that we um, say a, a very um, a, a very public and, and hearty thank you to the Virginia Wine Board who continues to um, to fund the the Winemakers Research Exchange. They have generously funded ag us again for the the 2020 season, which is why I can start talking to you about experiments for that season. So um, keep that in mind. And we also want to make sure to thank Mathieu Fino and um, King Family Vineyards for their work on this project and their willingness to share that with us. So thank you, Mathieu, for doing this work and for um, sharing your thoughts on it with us. Um, and I want to make sure thank to you. thank all of you for, for taking the time today to be with us, for filling out your sensory sheets um, and your, your continued interest in, in all of these projects. It, it's Really, honestly, it is great to see each one of you. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. I miss meeting with you each in person and I look forward to the day that we can do that again. But in the meantime, we'll keep doing this. So keep your eyes out. Um, you're, again, we'll have, a, um, we'll have a, another one of these in June, on June the 18th, and that information will roll out through the news or through the email um, in just a couple of weeks. I'll also have a newsletter probably early next week or midweek next week um, that will be coming into your email box as well. So, and please, please let me know if there's any experiments that you want to see done either by yourself or by um, by your colleagues next year as we kind of move into that piece of it. So, okay. So thank you all so very much. I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Joy. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joy. Bye, everybody. Be safe. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Everybody vote.